Book One, Section Six through Nine of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book One, Section Six through Nine. Section Six. But that those who take the opposite view have, in a certain way, right on their side, may be easily seen. For the words slavery and slave are used in two senses. There is a slave or slavery by law, as well as by nature. The law of which I speak is a sort of convention. The law by which whatever is taken in war is supposed to belong to the victors. But this right many jurists impeach, as they would an orator who has brought forward an unconstitutional measure. They detest the notion that, because one man has the power of doing violence, and is superior in brute strength, another shall be a slave and subject. Even among philosophers there is a difference of opinion. The origin of the dispute, and what makes the views invade each other's territory, is as follows. In some sense virtue, when furnished with means, has actually the greatest power of exercising force, and as superior power is only found where there is superior excellence of some kind. Power seems to imply virtue, and the dispute to be simply one about justice, for it is due to one party identifying justice with good will, while the other identifies it with the mere rule of the stronger. If these views are thus set out separately, the other views have no force or plausibility against the view that the superior in virtue ought to rule or be master. Others, clinging as they think simply to a principle of justice, for law and custom are a sort of justice, assume that slavery in accordance with the custom of war, is justified by law. But at the same moment they deny this. For what if the cause of the war be unjust? And again, no one would ever say he is a slave who is unworthy to be a slave. For if this were the case, men of the highest rank would be slaves, and the children of slaves if they or their parents chanced to have been captive and sold. Wherefore, Hellenes do not like to call other Hellenes slaves, but confine the term to barbarians. Yet, in using this language... They really mean the natural slave of whom we spoke at first. For it must be admitted that some are slaves everywhere, others nowhere. The same principle applies to nobility. Hellenes regard themselves as noble everywhere, and not only in their own country, but they deem the barbarians noble only when at home, thereby implying that there are two sorts of nobility and freedom, the one absolute and the other relative. The Helen of Theodectus says, Who would presume to call me servant? who am on both sides sprung from the stem of the gods. What does this mean but that they distinguished freedom and slavery, noble and humble birth, by the two principles of good and evil? They think that as men and animals beget men and animals, so from good men a good man springs. But this is what nature, though she may intend it, cannot always accomplish. We see then that there is some foundation for this difference of opinion and that all are not either slaves by nature or freemen by nature, and also that there is in some cases a marked distinction between the two classes, rendering it expedient and right for the one to be slaves and the others to be masters, the one a practicing obedience, the other exercising the authority and lordship which nature intended them to have. The abuse of this authority is injurious to both, for the interests of part and whole, of body and soul, are the same, and the slave is a part of the master a living but separated part of his bodily frame. Hence, where the relation of master and slave between them is natural, they are friends, and have a common interest. But where it rests merely on law and force, the reverse is true. Section 7. The previous remarks are quite enough to show that the rule of a master is not a constitutional rule, and that all the different kinds of rule are not, as some affirm, the same with each other. For there is one rule exercised over subjects who are by nature free, another over subjects who are by nature slaves. The rule of a household is a monarchy, for every house is under one head, whereas constitutional rule is a government of free men and equals. The master is not called a master because he has science, but because he is of a certain character, and the same remark applies to the slave and the freeman. Still, there may be a science for the master, and science for the slave. The science of the slave would be such as the man of Syracuse taught, who made money by instructing slaves in their ordinary duties. For such a knowledge may be carried further, so as to include cookery and similar menial arts. 
for some duties are the more necessary, others of the more honorable sort. As the proverb says, slave before slave, master before master. But all such branches of knowledge are servile. There is likewise a science of the master, who teaches the use of slaves. For the master as such is concerned, not with the acquisition, but with the use of them. Yet this so-called science is not anything great or wonderful, for the master need only know how to order that which the slave must know how to execute. Hence those who are in a position which places them above toil have stewards who attend to their households, while they occupy themselves with philosophy or with politics. But the art of acquiring slaves, I mean of justly acquiring them, differs both from the art of the master and the art of the slave, being a species of hunting or war. Enough of the distinction between master and slave. Section 8. Let us now inquire into property generally, and into the art of getting wealth, in accordance with our usual method, for a slave has been shown to be a part of property. The first question is whether the art of getting wealth is the same with the art of managing a household, or a part of it, or instrumental to it, and, if the last, whether in the way that the art of making shuttles is instrumental to the art of weaving, or in the way that the casting of bronze is instrumental to the art of the statuary. For they are not instrumental in the same way, but the one provides tools and the other material, and by material I mean the substratum out of which any work is made. Thus wool is the material of the weaver, bronze of the statuary. Now, it is easy to see that the art of household management is not identical with the art of getting wealth, for the one uses the material which the other provides. For the art which uses household stores can be no other than the art of household management. There is, however, a doubt whether the art of getting wealth is a part of the household management or a distinct art. If the getter of wealth has to consider whence wealth and property can be procured, but there are many sorts of property and riches, then are husbandry, and the care and provision of food in general, parts of the wealth-getting art or distinct arts. Again, there are many sorts of food, and therefore there are many kinds of lives, both of animals and men. They must all have food, and the differences in their food have made differences in their ways of life. For of beasts, some are gregarious, others are solitary. They live in the way which is best adapted to sustain them, accordingly as they are carnivorous, or herbivorous, or omnivorous. And their habits are determined for them by nature in such a manner that they may obtain with greater faculty the food of their choice. But, as different species have different tastes, the same things are not naturally pleasant to all of them. And therefore the lives of carnivorous or herbivorous animals further differ among themselves. In the lives of men, too, there is great difference. The laziest are shepherds, who lead an idle life and get their subsistence without trouble from tame animals, their flocks having to wander from place to place in search of pasture. They are compelled to follow them, cultivating a sort of living farm. Others support themselves by hunting, which is of different kinds. Some, for example, are brigands, others who dwell near lakes or marshes or rivers or a sea in which there are fish, are fishermen, and others live by the pursuit of birds or wild beasts. The greater number obtain a living from the cultivated fruits of the soil. Such are the modes of subsistence which prevail among those whose industry springs up of itself, and whose food is not acquired by exchange and retail trade. There is the shepherd, the husbandman, the brigand, the fisherman, and the hunter. Some gain a comfortable maintenance out of two employments, eking out the deficiencies of one of them by another. Thus the life of a shepherd may be combined with that of a brigand, the life of a farmer with that of a hunter. Other modes of life are similarly combined in any way which the needs of men may require. Property, in the sense of a bare livelihood, seems to be given by nature herself to all, both when they are first born and when they are grown up. For some animals bring forth, together with their offspring, so much food as will last until they are able to supply themselves. Of this, the vermiparous or oviparous animals are an instance, and the viviparous animals have, up to a certain time, a supply of food for their young in themselves, which is called milk. In like manner, we may infer that, after the birth of animals, plants exist for their sake, and that the other animals exist for the sake of man, the tame for the use in food, the wild, if not all, at least the greater part of them, for food, 
and for the provision of clothing and various instruments. Now if nature makes nothing incomplete and nothing in vain, the inference must be that she has made all animals for the sake of man. And so, in one point of view, the art of war is the natural art of acquisition. For the art of acquisition includes hunting, an art which we ought to practice against wild beasts, and against men who, though intended by nature to be governed, will not submit, for war of such kind is naturally just. Of the art of acquisition, then, there is one kind which is by nature a part of the management of a household, in so far as the art of household management must either find ready to hand, or itself provide, such things necessary to life, and useful for the community of the family or state, as can be stored. They are the elements of true riches, for the amount of property which is needed for a good life is not unlimited, though Solon in his poem says that, No bound to riches has been fixed for man. But there is a boundary fixed, just as there is in the other arts, for the instruments of any kind are never unlimited, either in number or size, and riches may be defined as the number of instruments to be used in a household or an estate. And so we see that there is a natural art of acquisition which is practiced by managers of households and by statesmen, and what is the reason of this? 9. There is another variety of the art of acquisition which is commonly and rightly called an art of wealth-getting, and has in fact suggested the notion that riches and property have no limit. Being nearly connected with the preceding, it is often identified with it. But though they are not very different, neither are they the same. The kind being described is given by nature, the other is gained by experience and art. Let us begin our discussion of the question with the following considerations. Of everything which we possess there are two uses. Both belong to the things as such, but not in the same manner, for one is the proper, and the other the improper or secondary use of it. For example, a shoe is used for wear, and is used for exchange. Both are the uses of the shoe. He who gives a shoe in exchange for money or food to him who wants one, does indeed use the shoe as a shoe. But this is not the proper or primary purpose, for a shoe is not made to be an object of barter. The same may be said of all possessions, for the art of exchange extends to all of them, and it arises at first from what is natural, from the circumstances that some have too little, others too much. Hence we may infer that retail trade is not a natural part of the art of wealth-getting. Had it been so, men would have ceased to exchange when they had enough. In the first community, indeed which is the family, this art is obviously of no use, but it begins to be useful when the society increases. For the members of the family originally had all things in common. Later, when the family divided into parts, the parts shared in many things, and different parts in different things, which they had to exchange in for what they wanted, a kind of barter which is still practiced among barbarian nations, who exchange with one another the necessaries of life, and nothing more, giving and receiving wine, for example, in exchange for coin and the like, this sort of barter is not part of the wealth-getting art, and is not contrary to nature, but is indeed needed for the satisfaction of men's natural wants. The other, or more complex form of exchange, grew, as might have been inferred, out of the simpler, when the inhabitants of one country became dependent on those of another, and they imported what they needed, and exported what they had too much of. Money necessarily came into use, for the various necessaries of life are not easily carried about, and hence men agreed to employ in their dealings with one another something which was intrinsically useful and easily applicable to the purposes of life. For example, iron, silver, and the like. Of this, the value was at first measured simply by size and weight, but in the process of time they put a stamp on it to save the trouble of weighing and mark the value. When the use of coin had once been discovered, out of the barter of necessary articles arose the other art of wealth getting, namely retail trade, which was at first probably a simple matter, but became more complicated as soon as men learned by experience whence and by what exchanges the greatest profit might be made. Originating in the use of coin, the art of getting wealth is generally thought to be chiefly concerned with it, and to be the art which produces riches and wealth, having to consider how they may be accumulated. Indeed, riches is assumed by many to be only a quantity of coin, because the arts of getting wealth and retail trade are concerned with coin. Others maintain that coin money is a mere sham, a thing not natural, but conventional only, 
because if the users substitute another commodity for it, it is worthless, because it is not useful as a means to any of the necessities of life, and indeed, he who is rich in coin may often be in want of necessary food. But how can that be wealth, of which a man may have a great abundance, and yet perish with hunger, like Midas in the fable, whose insatiable prayer turned everything which was set before him into gold? Hence, men seek after a better notion of riches and the art of getting wealth than the mere acquisition of coin, and they are right. For natural riches and the natural art of wealth-getting are a different thing. In their true form, they are part of the management of a household, whereas retail trade is the art of producing wealth, not in every way, but by exchange. And it is thought to be concerned with coin, for coin is the unit of exchange and the measure or limit of it. And there is no bound to the riches which may spring from this art of wealth-getting. As in the art of medicine, there is no limit to the pursuit of health. As in the other arts, there is no limit to the pursuit of their several ends. But they aim at accomplishing their ends to the uttermost. But of the means there is a limit, for the end is always the limit. So, too, in this art of wealth-getting, there is no limit of the end, which is the riches of the spurious kind, and the acquisition of wealth. But the art of wealth-getting, which consists in household management, on the other hand, has a limit. The unlimited acquisition of wealth is not its business. And therefore, in one point of view, all riches must have a limit. Nevertheless, as a matter of fact, we find the opposite to be the case. For all the getters of wealth increase their hoard of coin without limit. The source of the confusion is the near connection between the two kinds of wealth-getting. In either, the instrument is the same, although the use is different and so they pass into one another, for each is the use of the same property, but with a difference. Accumulation is the end in the one case, but there is a further end in the other. Hence, some persons are led to believe that the getting of wealth is the object of household management, and the whole idea of their lives is that they either ought to increase their money without limit, or at any rate not to lose it. The origin of this disposition in men is that they are intent upon living only, and not upon living well. And, as their desires are unlimited, they also desire that the means of gratifying them should be without limit. Those who do aim at a good life seek the means of obtaining bodily pleasures, and since the enjoyment of these appears to depend on property, they are absorbed in getting wealth. And so there arises the second species of wealth-getting. For as their enjoyment is an excess, they seek an art which produces the excess of enjoyment. And if they are not able to supply their pleasures by the art of wealth-getting, they try other arts, using in turn every faculty in a manner contrary to nature. The quality of courage, for example, is not intended to make wealth, but to inspire confidence. Neither is this the aim of the general's, or of the physician's art, but the one aims at victory, the other at health. Nevertheless, some men turn every quality or art into a means of getting wealth. This they conceive to be the end, and to the promotion of the end they think all things must contribute. Thus, then, we have considered the art of wealth-getting, which is unnecessary, and why men want it, and also the necessary art of wealth-getting, which we have seen to be different from the other, and to be a natural part of the art of managing a household, concerned with the provision of food, not, however, like the former kind, unlimited, but having a limit. End of Book 1, Section 6-9